Welcome to the Joint Replacement Center at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. For many of you, your life has been impaired because of problems with a malfunctioning joint. Our objective is to help you take the first steps toward making your quality of life better. Your successful and safe recovery from joint replacement surgery begins before you're admitted to the hospital and continues after discharge. This video is your guide and will answer many, but not all, of your questions. Questions about your surgery that arise after watching this video should be directed to your surgeon. For you to return home safely after surgery, you may need to make some changes in your home environment. It is best if you can make these changes before your surgery. Remove throw rugs and make sure electrical cords are not in the line of traffic. Nightlights should be placed in your bathroom, bedroom, and hallways. The floor of the tub or shower should have a rubber mat or non-skid surface. Create clear walking paths by moving furniture and other objects. If your bedroom is on the second floor, you may want to arrange for a bed on the first floor, provided there is a bathroom on that floor. There are exercises you can do at home that can help you to have a successful rehabilitation after surgery. Many of these exercises are the same as those you will have in your rehabilitation after surgery. Do not do these exercises if they are painful. Here are some suggested exercises to strengthen muscles that will help you get in and out of bed and use equipment to assist you in walking after surgery. Do each exercise 10 times and repeat the exercises three times a day. While sitting in a chair or lying on your back in bed, straighten your knee and slowly move both feet up and down. While sitting in a chair or lying on your back in bed, move both feet in a circular pattern. While sitting in a chair or lying on your back in bed, squeeze your buttocks together. Hold for several seconds. While lying on your back in bed, Tighten your thigh muscle by pressing your knee into the mattress. Hold for several seconds. While lying on your back in bed with your legs slightly out to the side, slide your heel along the bed towards your buttock to bend your hip. Then slide it out straight. Abdominal exercises or sit-ups. While lying on your back in bed with your hands behind your head, raise your head and body towards your feet by bending at the waist until you are sitting up. Then lay back on the bed. If you cannot do a complete sit-up, raise your head and body to a point where your stomach muscles tighten. Then hold for two to three seconds and then lay back. This strengthens your abdominal muscles which will help you in getting in and out of bed. These are particularly important to build strength that will help you use equipment to assist you in walking after surgery. Sit in an armchair with both feet flat on the floor. Place your hands on the armrests. Straighten your arms while raising your buttocks off the chair. Sit in an armchair with both feet flat on the floor. Hold a weight in your hand such as a bottle of water or a can of soup in each hand. Place your arm on the armrest of the chair. Bend your elbow, bring your hand towards your shoulder, lower your hand back into the armrest. There are items that you will want to bring with you at the hospital. At registration, you will need a driver's license or photo ID and your insurance card or cards. Pack a small bag with loose pajamas or nightgown and a short robe, if desired. Also, include underwear, loose shorts, and a jogging suit or sweatpants and tops to wear when you are discharged. For footwear, you'll want socks with either slippers and a back and rubberized sole, or walking sneakers, or shoes with Velcro closures or elastic shoelaces. You may bring your own toiletries. If you need them, don't forget eyeglasses, hearing aids and batteries, and denture cup cleanser. If you will be making calls outside of the local area, you will need a telephone credit card or a cell phone. It is always desirable to have a current list of your medications and supplements and a copy of your advanced healthcare directive. If you do not have an advanced healthcare directive, you may complete one when you come to the hospital. Please do not bring jewelry or other valuables with you. The hospital is not responsible for items lost during your stay with us.
If you use a CPAP, do not bring your machine to the hospital. Bring only the mask. You will be provided a hospital CPAP machine that can accommodate oxygen if you should require it. You will be working with a respiratory therapist to set this up for your specific needs. Unless specifically directed by your surgeon or the hospital, please do not bring your own medications. The medications you need will be provided by the hospital. You will meet with an anesthesiologist prior to your surgery. In some cases, your doctor may ask that this occur at Stanford Hospital and Clinics prior to your day of surgery. When arriving at the hospital, your driver will turn from Sand Hill Road toward the hospital onto Pasture Drive. There is a traffic light at Welch Road. Just past the light, your driver should note the Pasture Visitor's Garage where family and friends can park for a fee. Have your driver continue on Pasture Drive and drop you off at the fountain or main entrance to the hospital. After dropping you off, your driver can loop back to the parking garage or opt for valet parking. There is a fee for valet parking. If you need a wheelchair, one will be provided. When you enter the hospital, you would need to proceed to the second floor. The elevator is directly in front of you. Take the elevator to the second floor. When you exit the elevator, turn right and follow the signs to the Surgical Admission Unit, SAU. Turn right into the SAU. After signing in at the reception desk, you will proceed to patient access to complete the registration process and receive an ID wristband and a case number. This case number will allow your family and friends to track your surgery status. You will then be asked to take a seat in the reception waiting area where you can wait for your family and friends. A pre-operative, pre-op staff member will come to reception and call you when it is time to come into the pre-op area. Please do not bring any valuables into the pre-op area. Leave them at home or give them to a family member or friend. This includes jewelry and rings. You will be given a private area to change into a hospital gown and provided a bag for your clothes. The bag containing your clothes will be stored until you are transferred to your bed on our unit. After that, you will wait on a comfortable wheeled stretcher called a gurney. A nurse will conduct a brief interview about your medical history and medications, as well as verify your procedure. Some of these questions you have already answered, but by double checking and verifying that the information is correct, we are ensuring your safety. Once that is complete, usually about half an hour, one or two family members or friends may join you until you are taken to the operating room. While you are in pre-op, you will also meet with the operating room team and your anesthesiologist. This is a good time to get any remaining questions answered. Before you are taken to surgery, an intravenous line called an IV will be placed in your arm to provide access for medications and fluids. If your surgeon wants you to have an epidural or nerve block for pain control, these small flexible catheters or tubes will be placed. The epidural is placed in your back and the nerve block near your surgery site. You will also have a pulse oximeter that is usually attached by a sensor to your finger. This sensor monitors your pulse rate and oxygen levels. When you are ready to be taken to the operating room, the operating room nurse will meet you and ask you some final questions to ensure that you are ready for surgery. At this time, you will also see your surgeon and other members of the surgical team. Your family and friends can wait in an area across from the Surgery Admission Unit, or SAU. Your surgeon can advise your family and friends on the length of time that you will be in surgery. You will spend additional time in the recovery room after your surgery is complete. For those waiting for you, there is a wall monitor in the waiting area where your case number, not your name, will be posted and your procedure can be tracked by color codes. The color codes are explained on a chart next to the wall monitor. When you are moved from the recovery room to our unit, your family and friends can often accompany you. Immediately after your surgery, you will be taken to the recovery room, also called the PACU, or post-anesthesia care unit. You will stay in the recovery room until you are awake and your vital signs, temperatures, pulse, respirations, and blood pressure are stable and your pain is at an acceptable level. After that, you can be transferred to a room on our unit. You will not be able to have visitors in the recovery room. Once you are transferred to our unit, your family and friends may visit you there when you are settled. They will be notified of your location and given directions on how to find our unit. Your stay in the recovery room is one hour at a minimum, but there are reasons why it might take longer. 
a room on our unit may not be immediately available, or you may take a little longer to wake up and for your vital signs to stabilize. To assess your vital signs, you will be attached to devices that monitor your blood pressure, temperature, pulse, and respiration. You will also be receiving oxygen via a small tube in your nose. Your intravenous line, IV, will provide access for medications such as antibiotics, anti-nausea, and or pain medication, and if necessary, a blood transfusion. These devices will remain attached and will continue to be monitored on our unit. For the first 24 to 48 hours, you will likely need a urinary catheter to pass urine. If needed, the catheter will be inserted while you are asleep in surgery. Before you left the operating room, the surgeon attached equipment that will aid in your proper recovery. Your surgeon will decide what equipment is best for your recovery. Do not be concerned if another patient has different equipment. These may include the following. In recuperating from surgery, there is a tendency for blood to pool in the calf area. Your surgeon may want to use the device to limit the risk of deep vein thrombosis, DVT, or blood clots, and edema, swelling, while your mobility is limited. This device, called a sequential compression device, or SCD, utilizes inflating wraps around your lower legs that intermittently inflate, thereby promoting blood flow in your legs. Placing a pillow under the operated leg can promote a straight leg position and avoid a bent knee position. This pillow is not placed directly under the knee because it may cause excessive knee bending, which can prevent the knee joint from fully achieving a full straight leg position. There will be some blood loss during surgery. The purpose of the blood reinfusion conservation system device is to collect any blood from around your incision site and return it to you through your IV after it has been filtered. This reduces the chance that you will require a blood transfusion. Blood tests will be done daily to determine whether a transfusion is necessary. Please inform your physician if you are opposed to receiving blood transfusions for any reason. The nursing station is the main desk from which the administrative aspects of the unit are run. It is staffed by a unit secretary who will be one of the staff answering your call light. The resource or charge nurse is also stationed here when he or she is not out on our nursing unit. It is also the place for family and friends to come if they have questions or want to speak to your nurse. On the unit, we have a kitchen with an ice machine, refrigerator, coffee maker, and a microwave oven. If food is brought in for you from home, check with your doctor or nurse to ensure that you are medically able to eat it. These items should be labeled with your name and the date before those items are placed in the refrigerator. Food that is not labeled or has been in the refrigerator for more than 24 hours will be discarded. The nursing unit is equipped to monitor your vital signs centrally at the nursing station. Your pulse and blood oxygen levels are tracked through a sensor attached to your finger. This allows the nurses to be alert to your pulse and oxygen level even when they are not in your room. There are 27 rooms in the Joint Replacement Center, 17 are private rooms, and 10 rooms hold two patients. Priority for private rooms is given to patients at high risk for infection with communicable diseases or other medical conditions. Although we cannot take reservations for private rooms, if you are interested in a private room, please inform your nurse and we will try to accommodate your request. Each bed has a nurse call button, bedside monitors, a TV control, a bedside phone, and a white communication board. In addition, there is internet access. The nurse call button allows you to communicate your needs to a staff member when there is not one in the room. In addition, a member of the nursing staff will come to your room at least once an hour to check on your needs. The white communication board in your room is where your nurse and nursing assistants for the day record their names, the date, the goals for your day, the time of your last pain medication, and the time you were last repositioned or turned in bed. Making this information visible to you and other staff members helps assure proper follow-through. In your room are bedside monitors that, like the ones at the nursing station, monitor your pulse rate and oxygen levels through a sensor attached to your finger. You have a phone at your bedside. Family and friends may call your room directly from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. You may make local calls 24 hours a day but need a phone card for long-distance calls. You and your family and friends may also use your cell phones. You will have access to a TV during your stay. In addition to normal channels, there are health segments. Of particular importance is the health segment on patient falls. 
a member of the nursing staff will instruct you on the use of the TV controls. Should you want to connect to the internet, check with the staff member for the information you need to access the internet. The surgeon who performed your joint replacement will direct your care. This doctor guides your rehabilitation and follows you through office visits. You will also work with resident physicians and medical students under his supervision. Hospitalist doctors are internal medicine specialists trained in hospital medicine. They are assigned to our unit and work as collaborators and consultants with your surgeon. They see you at least once daily and communicate with you, your family, and or caretakers, your orthopedic team, your therapists, and your nurse. The hospital list is focused on addressing and managing all the medical issues that a patient may have in addition to their joint surgery. The unit is supervised by a nurse manager and two assistant nurse managers, all of whom are registered nurses. There is a resource nurse or charge nurse on each shift to address any concerns you may have. Registered nurses, RNs, are responsible for managing your bedside nursing care following your surgery. RNs provide education to you and your family about your health and safety needs and help in planning your discharge from our unit. They wear pewter, dark gray, colored scrub uniforms. In addition to the RNs, your care may be provided by nursing assistants who wear burgundy colored scrub uniforms and nursing students. A physical therapist, PT, plans your physical rehabilitation after your surgery. This therapist will help you regain range of motion muscle strength, and balance to walk safely with your new joint. You will learn how to use helping devices such as a walker or a cane that will be needed temporarily after your surgery. An occupational therapist, OT, is responsible for planning safe ways for you to complete your daily activities such as bathing and dressing. The OT may partner with the PT to complete your exercise routines. The PTs and OTs wear teal, blue-green colored scrub uniforms. Your case manager or discharge planner is a registered nurse who works with your health care team to develop and assist in implementing your discharge from our unit. A member of the housekeeping department will be responsible for cleaning your room on a daily basis. Please let a staff member know if additional cleaning is needed. Fresh linen is provided daily. Your safety is our number one concern. Throughout this presentation, you will find important information about your safety. We will make sure that you are aware of and involved in your own care so we can work together to assure your safety. Good hand hygiene is essential to prevent infection and the spread of disease. Outside of each room is an alcohol gel dispenser. All staff and family and friends who enter your room should cleanse their hands with this gel. This process needs to be repeated when they exit the room. Anyone who examines you should either wash their hands with soap and water or use alcohol gel both before and after the examination. If you feel these processes are not being followed, please call it to the attention of a staff member. Your blood pressure, pulse, temperature, and respirations, breathing, are referred to as vital signs or vitals. These are taken routinely every four hours while you are on our unit. Your condition may warrant more or less frequent vital sign checks. Each bed has a nurse call button. This is an important two-way communication device and safety feature. When you need something, push the button. This call rings through to the nursing station where it will be answered by the unit secretary. Your call will be routed to the person most appropriate to meet your need or request. That person will come to your room to address your needs. In addition, a member of the nursing staff will come to your room at least once an hour to check on your needs. Much of the equipment used in your care has an alarm. Alarms provide an alert to the staff to check on you and or equipment. The alarm is often routine and does not signal that anything is wrong. In the event you hear an alarm and a staff member does not quickly respond to the alarm, simply put on your call light. Alarms are designed to promote safety, but we want to minimize the number of alarms so that you can have a quiet and restful environment in which to recover. Each time you receive a medication, the staff member will scan your wristband. As an additional safety measure, you will also be asked your name and date of birth. This is to confirm that the right patient is receiving the right medication and reduce the possibility of medication errors. The nurse will explain about each medication prior to administering the medication. 
For safety reasons, we ask while medications are being administered that you keep interruptions to a minimum to allow the nurse to focus on the administration of medications. Blood clots in the leg veins are the most common complication of total joint replacement surgery. The most common approaches to prevent blood clots are blood thinners and ankle pump exercises. Your surgeon may also have attached a sequential compression device following surgery. Your surgeon will choose a blood thinner that may be in the form of a pill or an injection. We will instruct you on the proper use of the blood thinner and how to perform the ankle pump exercises. Because it is important to keep your lungs expanded, you will be provided with a plastic device called an incentive spirometer that helps you measure your efforts at taking deep breaths. This device, or incentive spirometer, should be used 10 times every hour while awake. The nurse or nurse assistant will help coach you in its use. This is very important to prevent post-operative lung problems and pneumonia. Preventing falls is an important safety issue both while you are on our unit and when you return home. Most falls do not result in injury, but some can cause broken bones, bleeding, or even a fatality. Even if you are young and have never fallen before, there is a greater risk of falling following your surgery. Weakness or the side effects of medication may cause you to feel dizzy or confused. Your surgery can make you weak or in pain when you stand or walk. You may not be getting proper nutrition. You may feel fine while lying down, but unsteady when you get up. Awkward medical equipment and new surroundings can contribute to falls. Patients identified as being at high risk for a fall are identified with yellow socks and armbands. This alerts the staff to take precautions to avoid a fall. Most falls occur while going to or from the bathroom or commode. You are one of the keys to preventing falls. Always ask for assistance when getting out of bed, even if you think you can manage. Should you fall, do not try to get up by yourself. If the nurse call button is in reach, use it. If not, wait until someone can assist you. If you have serious concerns regarding your medical condition or care, you are asked to communicate first with your healthcare team. If after talking with your healthcare team, you feel the problem has not been addressed, consider activating the Stanford hotline. The number for the hotline is on the bulletin board in your room. The surgeon, residents, and medical students will examine you daily and create the plan for your care. This generally occurs early in the morning. You and your nurse will usually be involved in the planning as well. There is a daily team discussion that takes place about your progress toward discharge. The team consists of your nurse, the resource charge nurse, case manager, social worker, physical therapist, occupational therapist, dietitian, physicians, and occasionally a chaplain. Your status is discussed as it relates to identifying and resolving issues so that your discharge is appropriate and timely. For example, the team may discuss whether you can be discharged to your home or whether a skilled nursing facility would be more appropriate. To ensure that your needs are being met, a member of the nursing staff will be checking in with you at least once every hour to check your pain, to assist you with your waste elimination needs, to help you to reposition yourself, and to ensure that items around you are within your reach. This is a good time to ask questions or voice concerns that do not necessarily warrant the use of your call light. If you need assistance before hourly nursing rounds, please indicate your specific needs using the nursing call light system at your bedside. When there is a change of shift in your nursing care, the exchange of information from the nursing staff member going off duty and the nursing staff member coming on duty is conducted at your bedside. This exchange lets you participate in setting the goals for the next shift and gives you the opportunity to add or correct information. During this exchange, the nursing staff member will inspect your surgical dressing, look at your IV site, inspect your skin, and update the white communication board. You may have a member of your family or a friend included in this exchange. Change of shift occurs at 7 a.m., 3 p.m., 7 p.m., and 11 p.m. Baths are provided for patients who are unable to bathe themselves. The baths are provided in the form of a package of warm wipes. Toothbrushes and toothpaste are available for your oral hygiene. You may also bring your own toiletries. For the immediate post-op period, passing urine may be accomplished by the use of a urinary catheter. 
When the catheter is removed, a urinal, bedpan, and our commode will be provided to you. The drugs used in anesthesia and pain control will slow your bowel movements for a day or more. Drink plenty of fluids and eat whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. The staff may recommend a stool softener or laxative to help return normal bowel function. There is a bathroom in every patient room. When you have achieved your ambulation goals, you will be able, with assistance, to walk to the bedside commode or to the bathroom. You are at increased risk of pneumonia after surgery, and you can help prevent it. The spirometer helps to exercise and expand your lungs. Try to do 10 breaths with your spirometer every hour. Also, it is good to cough, take deep breaths, and be as mobile as your recovery will permit. These activities may be painful, but help in achieving a healthy recovery. At least every two hours, you will be assisted to find a position in bed that provides comfort and prevents prolonged pressure on any one body part. This procedure prevents pressure ulcers, bed sores, and allows your nurse to inspect your skin. Laboratory blood draws are routinely done starting at 5.30 a.m. and may occur intermittently throughout the day for those patients that have orders for them. The early blood draws assure that the results are available to your physicians during rounds. If you are a diabetic or tend to have higher blood sugars, the nurse will be testing your blood by finger stick four times a day. Meals on Demand is a program that is very much like room service. You are provided a menu from which you can order what you like and when you would like it delivered. If you have dietary restrictions, you will have different options from which to choose. Generally, the meal arrives within 45 minutes of the request. The hours for meals on demand are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. There are other options to obtain snacks during the nighttime hours. This approach allows patients to select food that sounds good as anesthesia and medication may affect your sense of taste. Your initial pain may be minimal, but the drugs used during surgery will eventually wear off. Our goal is to manage your pain enough that you can rest and take part in physical therapy. As time goes on, your pain will lessen. By the time you are discharged, you will likely only be using oral medications for pain control. Both before and after you take pain medication, your nurse will ask you to describe your pain level on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is no pain and one to two is mild pain. Three to four is moderate pain. Five to six is severe pain. Seven to eight is very severe pain. And nine to 10 is the worst possible pain. It is important that you take pain medication before the level of pain becomes high. It is also essential that you take medication before you do therapy so that pain does not limit your ability to fully participate in the exercises and mobility that the rehabilitation staff has for you. Pain control is very important to your post-operative recovery. Your surgeon and anesthesiologist will collaborate to individualize a plan for pain management. The following are some of the methods that can be used to achieve pain control. Your specific pain management plan may use more than one of these methods. A patient-controlled analgesia, or PCA pump, can be connected to your IV line. It allows you to press a button that releases a dose of pain medication into your vein at intervals prescribed by your doctor. An epidural catheter is a small flexible tube placed into the epidural space, the outermost part of the spinal canal, of your spine at the lumbar, lower back level. This catheter is connected to a pump that introduces pain medication continuously. A nerve block catheter is a small flexible tube that is used to deliver small amounts of anesthetic, numbing medication, to bathe the nerves near the surgical site. As quickly as possible, you will be transitioned to oral medications that are very effective for pain control. If you arrive on our unit early on the day of surgery, you may be assisted to sit up and dangle your legs over the side of the bed or to get up out of bed with the help of a physical therapist. After surgery, you will be taught some simple exercises. Get out of bed without help and sit at the edge of the bed. With help, you will stand and begin to walk as soon as you are ready. You will be assisted by physical therapists and occupational therapists who will visit you daily, including weekends. Their job is to teach you how to be mobile and care for yourself after your surgery. 
it is important for you to follow the directions that the therapist, nurses, and doctors provide. Your surgeon may have you set up on a continuous passive motion, or CPM device. This device gently cradles your operative leg and flexes and extends your knee. This motion helps with knee movement. The goal is to bend and straighten your knee, whether using the CPM device or the exercises. Some of the exercises you'll be asked to do are the same ones you practice prior to your surgery, such as ankle pumps and rotations, buttock contractions, quad sets, and bed-supported knee bends. It is helpful to do these three times a day between visits from your therapist so you can build your strength. Remember these from the beginning of the video? These are ankle pumps. While lying on your back in bed, straighten your knee and slowly move both feet up and down. Ankle rotations. While lying on your back in bed, move both feet in a circular pattern. Gluteal contractions. Squeeze your buttocks together and hold for several seconds. Quad sets. While lying on your back in bed, tighten your thigh muscles by pressing your knees down into the mattress. The following exercises are new for the post-operative rehabilitation period. Hip abduction. Slide your operated leg out to the side, keeping the heel on the bed. Keep your knee pointing toward the ceiling. Return to the starting position. Short arc quad. Place a rolled towel or pillow under your knee. Lift the heel of your operated leg off the bed and straighten your knee completely. Return to the starting position. During this exercise, keep your thighs on the towel or pillow. Straight leg raise. Bend your non-operated leg. Lift your operated leg up as high as your opposite knee. Lower the operated leg slowly to the start position. Sitting knee flexion. Sit on a chair with your thighs supported by the seat of the chair. Your operated foot should dangle freely, allowing your knee to bend slowly. Pull your heel back under your chair, buttocks. Use your non-operated leg to assist your operated knee to bend further. Long arc quad. Sit in a chair with your thighs supported by the seat of the chair. Straighten your operated knee fully while keeping your thigh on the chair. Slowly lower your leg to its starting position. Standing hip flexion. While supported by a therapist or holding onto a table or counter, lift the operated knee toward the hip and then slowly lower the leg to the floor. Toe raises. While supported by a therapist or holding onto a table or counter, raise up on your toes, hold for a count of three, and then slowly lower your heel to the ground. You will continue to be taught new ways of getting in and out of bed, how to get in and out of a chair, using the toilet or commode, and getting dressed. Progression of therapy will depend on your individual recovery. You will be taught how to get out of bed by sliding yourself to the edge of the bed using your arms and pushing with your non-operated leg. Keep your legs apart and your toes pointed towards the ceiling. Move your shoulders in the opposite direction of your legs. Slowly move both legs over the edge of the mattress. Gradually come to a seated position with your hands behind you on the mattress to give you support. Be sure the operated foot is pointing forward. Ensure your feet are firmly planted under you, and while maintaining balance and using the walker, slowly rise to standing. Reverse the process to return to bed. A leg lifter may be a helpful tool to use for getting in and out of bed. To walk, you will be taught to stand up tall and look ahead while you walk. Move the walker or crutches forward, first followed by your operated leg. Then move your unaffected leg forward. Put your weight on the walker or crutches to take the weight off of your operated leg when you step onto it. To get in and out of a chair, choose a firm straight back chair with armrests. Back up to the chair until the edge of the chair hits your leg. Sit on the front edge of the chair by putting your operated leg forward and use the armrest to lower yourself into the chair. Scoop backward until you are firmly seated. Reverse this process to get out of the chair. 
Until you are completely recovered, you should avoid low, soft sofas and stools. Follow this procedure when sitting at a table or desk. For toileting, use a commode chair or raised toilet seat, which will make it easier to sit and stand. Be sure not to bend too far forward at the hips and do not twist to your side while cleaning yourself. If you are using a toilet, remember to face the toilet to flush. To get dressed, reachers or dressing sticks are helpful in putting on and removing pants. Always put your operated leg in the pants first. Use the reacher to pull your pants up. When undressing, always take your operated leg out last. A sock aid or dressing stick can be used to put on and take off socks. Shoes can be slipped on and off with a long shoehorn or with a reacher. Elastic laces can also make it easier to slip shoes on and off. The day of discharge is variable and depends on each individual patient progress toward their goals. A shorter or longer stay is dependent on how quickly a patient moves through the rehab process. As you have heard, planning for your discharge began at the time you entered the unit and has been the subject of daily discussion in unit team rounds. Your case manager as well as your physicians, therapists, and nurses will be involved in your discharge process. If you are unable to return home after your hospital stay or because you need additional therapy, your physician or therapist will recommend a short stay in a skilled nursing facility, SNF, until you are more independent and mobile. The case manager will work with you and your insurance company to make the necessary arrangements for a room at a SNF, as well as facilitating the transportation from our unit to the SNF. If you have met the therapy goals, have good pain control, are medically stable, and have adequate support at home, you will be discharged to home. In that case, your physician will most likely order physical and occupational therapy at home. The case manager will arrange this. Occasionally, it may be necessary to arrange for a home health nurse to monitor your wound or medication. The case manager will give you the names and phone numbers for any health care agency scheduled to come to your home. As part of the discharge to your home, we will assure that you understand the signs and symptoms of wound infection and the post-op guidelines as well as having the contact numbers for emergencies. We will identify the activities you can or cannot perform due to your limited range of motion and the precautions required. We will review with you the purpose of all medications you will be taking. After surgery, you are at risk for forming a blood clot in your veins and your legs, which can move to your lungs. Your surgeon has a prevention plan for you that may include blood thinning medication alone or a combination of medication and a leg pump machine that intermittently squeezes your calf muscles. Your nurse will go over the plan your surgeon has chosen for you and instruct you on the administration of the medication. If you are going home, you will be given prescriptions for discharge medications that can be filled at your local pharmacy. Be sure that you have all of your prescriptions. If you are going to a skilled nursing facility, they will provide your medications. Your surgeon will likely prescribe some equipment known as durable medical equipment, or DME. This equipment is often covered by your insurance and can be obtained prior to discharge. Examples are aids in walking, such as a walker, crutches, or a cane, and or bedside commode. If you are going home, we will make sure that the prescribed equipment has been ordered. The equipment can be delivered to our unit or sent to your home. Your surgeon may want you to have an extra surgical dressing. If so, you will be instructed on how to change the dressing. You can purchase more if needed at any drugstore. If you are going to a skilled nursing facility, they will order the prescribed equipment. Should you need additional equipment during your hospital stay, we will provide you with certain optional equipment such as a leg lifter, a device that helps you move your leg. There is other equipment often not covered by insurance that is very handy for use after surgery. Examples are a sock aid to help in putting on a pair of socks by yourself, a reacher grabber dressing stick that can help to pull up your pants, reach for dropped items, or obtain items higher than your arms can reach, and a long-handled sponge that can help you clean hard-to-reach places during bathing. The reacher grabber dressing stick can be purchased at the Stanford Hospital gift shop. Additionally, a raised toilet seat with or without arms may also be helpful. This and the other mentioned items can be found in medical supply stores or some pharmacies. The discharge process can be complicated and there are sometimes delays in completing the process. 
We want to make sure that all of the steps for your safe return to home or a skilled nursing facility have been completed. The case manager and the nursing staff will keep you informed of the progress toward discharge. Transportation. If you are going to a skilled nursing facility, the case manager will make arrangements for medical transportation. This may or may not be covered by your medical insurance. Regulations do not permit you to drive or to use a taxi unescorted. If you need transportation to your home, the case manager will make arrangements for medical transportation. This may or may not be covered by your medical insurance. If you are going home, you should make arrangements in advance to have a responsible adult to drive you home. Give some thought to the type of vehicle that will take you home. A compact car may be too small, and an SUV may be too high. Be sure at the point of discharge that you have all of your belongings. If you are going home by car, you will be taken to the car by a member of the transport team. Move the front seat back as far as it will go. In some cases, you may need to recline the seat. Back up to the seat. Bring your operated leg forward and sit down. Scoop back toward the driver's seat. Bring your legs around to the front, keeping your legs straight. Complications and risks for infection are low for total joint replacement. However, you will need to look for signs of infection and other complications so you can notify your surgeon should problems arise. For at least two weeks following your surgery, be aware of the following and call your surgeon immediately if they occur. Fever of 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 38.5 degrees Celsius or higher. Pain not relieved by prescription pain medication. Excessive leg swelling and pain. Redness, swelling, bleeding, or drainage from your incision site. Edges of the incision coming apart. Sudden coldness or discoloration at the incision site. Difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, or chest pain. Persistent nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Take your temperature daily at the same time for the next two weeks. To prevent infection, wash your hands for 30 seconds before checking your surgical incision. Follow your surgeon's instructions for bathing and showering. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, you are at risk for forming a blood clot in your leg veins which can move to your lungs. Follow the plan that your surgeon has prescribed for you for preventing clots. The specific instructions will be provided to you at discharge. Call your surgeon immediately if you develop any of the following symptoms. Increasing pain in your calf muscle of either leg. Increasing swelling in your calf, ankle, or foot of either leg. Tenderness or redness above or below either knee. If you experience any of the following symptoms. Sudden increased shortness of breath. Sudden onset of chest pain. Localized chest pain with coughing. Go to the nearest emergency room as these symptoms may be signs that a blood clot has traveled to your lungs. Although we don't expect you to experience these symptoms, it underlines the importance of taking your prescribed medications as directed to prevent these types of problems. You will also be prescribed pain medications to take after discharge. It is very important that you know exactly how to take these medications and what side effects they may have. You will be given a handout at discharge explaining about the pain medications and side effects. You should take pain medications at regular intervals. You can space out the timing for longer intervals when you feel you are comfortable or take one tablet instead of two until you decide you no longer need the pain medication. If your pain medications are not working, do not take more than what is prescribed. Instead, notify your surgeon so that adjustments can be made. Blood thinning medications should be taken at the same time each day. Follow the instructions given to you for the type of blood thinner you have been prescribed. Be sure to notify caregivers, dentists, and your other doctors that you are on a blood thinner before having any procedures done. While on blood thinners, watch for bleeding gums, nosebleeds, or blood in your urine or stool. If you have excessive bruising or these signs of bleeding, call your surgeon. Also, call your surgeon should you experience any injuries like bumping your head or falling. Do not take aspirin, Advil, ibuprofen, or other NSAIDs 
non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs while taking a blood thinner unless instructed to do so by your surgeon. These drugs increase your risk of bleeding and can also impair the bone healing process. If you are giving a self-injectable medication, you will be given a container to keep the used needles. These can be discarded at some local pharmacies. You should check with the pharmacy to see if they provide this service. Do not throw used needles away in the regular trash. If you do not receive a container for needle disposal, you can use an empty liquid detergent container made from hard plastic or a coffee can with a lid to keep the needles until you take them to a pharmacy for disposal. You were given specific instructions for movement and exercise based on the type of surgery you have had. It is important for you to follow these instructions for the length of time recommended. It is important to balance your activity with the rest periods for the next couple of weeks. It is normal for you to feel tired. If you feel you are not improving or are extremely tired all of the time, you should notify your surgeon. When you walk around, you must use your cane, walker, or crutches as instructed for the length of time recommended. A fall can happen easily if you are not using your equipment correctly, since your balance is not as good because of muscle weakness and the effects of pain medications. Exercise is important for good health. However, during your healing time, the next 12 weeks, you should only be doing the exercises given to you by your physical therapist unless clear to do so by your surgeon. You should also ask this question during your follow-up appointment with your surgeon. Driving should resume once you are off pain medication and have full reflexes of your driving leg. You will need to be able to move your foot from the gas pedal to the brake pedal easily and quickly. Your doctor can give you a guideline as to how long you should refrain from driving. Unless you resume driving, plan on arranging alternative transportation. You may have a follow-up appointment already arranged with your surgeon to discuss your progress. It may be as early as two weeks or up to six weeks post-operatively, depending on your surgeon. If you do not know your next appointment date, call your surgeon's office and the secretary will schedule your appointment. You may contact your specific surgeon's office or the Joint Replacement Center if you have more questions about discharge. The Joint Replacement Center phone number is 650-725-7110. Stanford Hospital and Guest Services provides personal assistance, support, and resources for patients and guests. The goal is to focus on your unique needs before, during, and after your hospitalization. Some of the many resources available to you and your family and friends are the Health Library, where you can find more information on your health questions. Navigators who are staff members wearing red jackets that can direct you in our facility and patient representatives who can assist you in addressing concerns and questions. Should you require it, interpreter services can provide medical interpretation 24 hours a day at no cost throughout your stay with us. Interpretation is available in all languages, including American Sign Language. Guest services may be contacted at 650-498-3333. My name is Walt. My first knee replacement was in July of 2002. I had been having trouble with my left knee for a long time, the result of a skiing accident. In 1999, I had arthroscopic surgery, and in 2001, I had hyaluronic acid injections. They offered temporary relief. In February of 2002, six months ahead of the time of the operation, I started working with a specially trained personal trainer twice a week to prepare for the operation. I'm still going there twice a week for general good health. The operation was in July of 2002. After the operation, I was put on a machine that gradually flexes your knee. The pain was more than I expected for the first few days. I think pain management has improved tremendously since then. When I was discharged, I was transferred to a skilled nursing facility for recovery. The therapist escorted me to the car and showed me how to get in. When I left the skilled nursing facility for home, I had the full complement of equipment crutches, walker, and a potty chair. The occupational and physical therapist visits me at home to complete my rehabilitation. After the prescribed length of time, I resume my normal activities, including skiing. 
My second total knee op replacement was in February of 2010. This knee was just plain worn out after so many years of favoring my other leg, which was so badly injured in the skiing accident. This operation was in February 2010. It went smoothly. I noticed improvements in the technique from eight years earlier. The incision was smaller. The pain seemed much less. They used a sleeve with a little hydraulic pump periodically on my legs to prevent clotting. When I was discharged, I was sent to a skilled nursing facility nearby. At the skilled nursing facility, I received physical therapy before I went home. Now I forget that I have ever had any operations. I have zero pain and I have taken up a new activity, horseback riding. My name is Gary. I am 73 years old. 10 years ago, I had both knees replaced. I had previously had orthoscopic surgery on my left knee and it was now preventing me from golfing. So I scheduled an appointment with my surgeon. Leading up to the appointment, my right knee became so painful that I could barely drive a car. My surgeon suggested replacing both knees and I agreed. The surgery was successful and I entered physical therapy with three goals in mind. Walk 18 holes of golf again, dance at my son's wedding, and travel in the Galapagos Islands on a small ship with ladders between decks. It took hard work, but I accomplished all three goals and my pain was significantly reduced. Today, I walk 18 holes of golf three times a week and lead an active life including travel and trying to keep up with my grandchildren. My advice to anyone embarking on a knee replacement is to have some goals for how your life will be improved if you have the surgery and follow your physical therapy and exercise programs. We would like to provide information for family and friends that may be helpful as they support the patient during surgery. Here's a summary of the information family and friends will need. Parking, parking for family and friends in the pasture visitor's garage, also designated as PS4 on some maps. From Sand Hill Road, you turn toward the hospital onto Pasture Drive. There is a light at Welch Road. Just past the light is an entrance to the parking garage on your left. We recommend that you drop off your patient at the fountain or main entrance to the hospital by continuing on Pasture Drive. After dropping the patient off, you can loop back to the parking garage. There is a charge for parking. If you prefer, valet parking is available at the fountain or front entrance to the hospital. There is a charge for valet parking. When you exit the parking garage, a representative of guest services will arrange transportation to the entrance. If you need a wheelchair, one will be provided. If you wish to walk, follow the signs on the sidewalk to the fountain entrance. Patient check-in. When you enter, you will need to proceed to the second floor. The elevator is directly in front of you. Take the elevator to the second floor. When you exit the elevator, turn right and follow the signs to the Surgical Admission Unit, SAU. Turn right into the SAU. Your patient will sign in at the reception desk and then complete the registration process. Family and friends can sit in the reception waiting area. After registering, the patient will join you until a pre-operative, pre-op staff member comes for them. After about a half hour, one or two family or friends can join the patient waiting for surgery to begin. Those who are joining the patient should remain in the reception waiting area until called by a staff member. Other family and friends should move to the waiting area across from the SAU. There is a large waiting room outside the unit for larger groups. The surgeon can advise your family and friends on the length of time that the patient will be in surgery. Additional time will be spent in the recovery room. While waiting, family and friends are free to use the Market Square Cafe on the first floor of the main hospital. It is open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The cafeteria sells a wide range of beverages, snacks, and meals. Adjacent to the cafeteria is a cafe with a more limited menu that is open Monday to Friday from 6 a.m. to midnight. There is internet access. Check with the personnel at the desk in the waiting area for the information you need to access the internet. Checking the status of surgery. A case number was given to the patient upon registration. For those waiting for the patient, 
there is a wall monitor in the waiting room where the case number, not the patient's name, will be posted and the procedure can be tracked by color codes. The color codes are explained on a chart next to the wall monitor. When the patient is moved from the recovery room to our unit, you can often accompany them. Recovery. Only medical personnel are allowed access to the recovery room. When the patient is transported from the recovery room to the joint replacement center, family and friends can often accompany them. Joint replacement center location. When leaving the reception waiting area, turn right and follow the signs toward unit B, C, D, H. A large open atrium will be on your right. Just past the atrium, there will be elevators on your right. Take the elevator down to the ground level, G. Upon leaving the elevator, turn right and then right again. Ahead of you will be the door to the joint replacement center. When you walk through the door, the nursing station will be straight ahead of you. Unit visitor policies. Visiting hours are between 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. We encourage family and friends to visit during these hours only. If the patient is in a private room, one family member or friend may stay overnight if the patient's condition permits. This is subject to the availability of rollaway beds. The number of visitors is limited to two at a time in the room. We recommend that no children under the age of 12 visit for their own protection as well as the patients. There is a large waiting area outside the entrance of the unit for large groups. The safety of your family member or your friend is our number one concern. Good hand hygiene is essential to prevent infection and the spread of disease. Outside of each room is an alcohol gel dispenser. All staff, family, and friends who enter the patient's room should cleanse their hands with this gel. This process needs to be repeated when they exit the room. Anyone who examines the patient should wash their hands with soap and water or use the gel both before and after the examination. If you feel these processes are not being followed, please call it to the attention of a staff member. For safety reasons, we also ask that while medications are being administered, that you keep interruptions to a minimum to allow the nurse to focus on the administration of medications. When there is a change of shift in the patient's nursing care, the exchange of information from the nursing staff member going off duty to the nursing staff member coming on duty is conducted at the patient's bedside. This exchange lets the patient participate in setting the goals for the next shift and gives them the opportunity to add or correct information. During this exchange, the nursing staff member will inspect their surgical dressing, look at the IV site, inspect the patient's skin, and update the white communication board in their room. They may ask that a member of their family or a friend be included in this exchange. Change of shift occurs at 7 a.m., 3 p.m., 7 p.m., and 11 p.m. If you have serious concerns about the medical condition or care of your family member or friend, you are asked to communicate first with their healthcare team. If after talking with their healthcare team member, you feel that the problem has not been addressed, consider activating the Stanford hotline. The number for the hotline is on the bulletin board in the patient's room. Unit phone. The nursing unit phone number is 650-725-7110. Family and friends can call the nursing station 24 hours a day. Due to patient privacy, we can only give limited information over the phone. Please call the patient or designate a family member to provide medical status updates to other family and friends. Patient phone. There is a phone at the bedside of every patient. Family and friends may call the patient's room directly from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Patients may make local calls 24 hours a day but need a phone card for long distance calls. Stanford Hospital and Guest Services provides personal assistance, support and resources for patients and guests. The goal is to focus on your unique needs before, during, and after your hospitalization. Some of the many resources available to you and your family and friends are the Health Library, where you can find more information on your health questions. Navigators who are staff members wearing red jackets that can direct you to our facility, and patient representatives who can assist you in addressing concerns and questions. Should you require it, interpreter services can provide medical interpretation 24 hours a day at no cost throughout your stay with us. Interpretation is available in all languages, including American Sign Language. Guest services may be contacted at 
498-4983-3333. Our goal is to improve the quality of life for our patients and provide the best possible care in doing that.